Okay, this one of you is I haven't got any pictures for you, um, so you can rest your eyes. I know it's a, a lot of science, a lot of graphs and charts, so I'm just going to talk instead. Um, I've been asked to speak about political challenges and solutions, and I guess with what happened on um, September the 7th, we now have a, uh, a greater challenge we did before. I think in terms of climate politics, there are two really standout things I want to talk about. The first is that we now have a national government as well as state governments everywhere in South Australia and Tasmania, which we would benignly call deny and delay governments. Um, I actually call deny, delay, deregulate governments that see climate and environment as a culture war. So it's a war to be won, and I'll talk some more about that. The second thing is that public policy making in Australia and internationally suffers from what I would call collective cognitive dissonance. Do you know what cognitive dissonance is? Where your understanding, your, your construction of the world is actually quite different from the way it really is. It, um, delusionary would be a short word. Uh, in that systematically refused to, refuses to recognise the scale and the depth and the speed with which we have to act. And I'll talk about that as well. So we are underestimating the climate problem in our public discussion in our media. I've just written a thing called Is Climate Change Already Dangerous? I'll give you the website uh, a bit later. And I can only come to the conclusion that for, and I think Dan's actually shown this already, for the greenhouse gases already in the air, we will have very dangerous climate change. So, as Aaron pointed out, the international policy-making framework, um, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, talks about keep, keeping global warming to two degrees. This is a political benchmark, not a scientific benchmark. And yet we know that for two degrees, there will be no summer sea ice in the Arctic. So, an area of ice that's located in the Arctic Ocean um, a long, long time, um, an area of ice that used to be the size of Australia in summer will not exist. So we are in the process, and in fact, some environments say we have already destroyed the Arctic ecosystem. The second thing is that at two degrees of warming, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, which is an ice sheet um, that contains enough sea level for seven metres, enough ice for seven metres of sea level rise, will be past its tipping point. It may be close now, we don't know. The trouble with a lot of tipping points where the system changes from one, one quality to another um, is that they're by nature discontinuous and difficult to predict events and you only actually see them in retrospect. Uh, but we appear to be not too far away from Greenland at the moment. And thirdly, um, and this is what really annoys me about Greg Hunt, if I may make a political comment, um, at about one and a half degrees of global warming, remember we're at 0.9 now and we have got enough in the system to get us to two, at about one and a half degrees of global warming, you'll get enough extreme events in terms of um, very high ocean temperatures, uh, storm surges, to basically knock out most of the world's coral reefs. And they take 10 years to recover. So if you have one of these extreme events, once every 10 years, you've basically lost the world's coral systems. Uh, and work from Australian scientists recently said that about one and a half degrees of warming, our coral systems will be down to 10% of their state 50 years ago. So when Greg Hunt says, I'm going to get $5 million to save the Barrier Reef, it's complete. The second reason we know it's already dangerous is by looking at climate history. And we have, as Darren's pointed out, that the level of carbon dioxide is about 400 parts per million at the moment. We know there was a past period three to five million years ago when, when uh, greenhouse gases were also at that level. Um, and we know that at that time that the seas were 20 to 40 metres higher than they are now. Now it takes a long while to get that full effect. Um, but we are now constructing a world where human civilization, which is basically built on coasts, on river deltas, river deltas are the most productive uh, land on this planet. Um, 
will be under tens of metres of water. So these are the sort of things that I could talk about for a long time that are not part of the public discussion. Even environment groups. They're all saving the Arctic. Who's saving the Arctic? Greenpeace. Who's saving the, ba the Barrier Reef? We don't have coal exports. We'll save the Barrier Reef. Sorry, folks, we won't for the amount of greenhouse gases we already have in the air. So the political conclusion we draw from this, and I draw on the work of like for Professor Kevin Anderson, who's director of the Kindle Centre in the United Kingdom, who's a very forthright, forthright climate scientist. Um, I've left outside a little two-page article he wrote um, with a colleague of his for the journal Nature a couple of years ago. Um, it's actually not behind a paywall, so there's not copies out there. I would really urge you to read it. It's called A New Paradigm for Climate Change. If you Google that, you'll find it. It's a Nature article, as I said, it's not behind a paywall. The two articles are called, the two authors are Anderson and Bose, B O W S. And there is a wonderful, wonderful, concise summary of this political dissonance, the difference between the science and the politics. And Anderson is actually the um, instigator of what's called the Radical Emissions Reductions Conference, which is going to be held in London at the end of this year. And I just want to read one paragraph from their website, which I think really well sums up the problem. And the, the uh, conference uh, aim says, Today, in 2013, we face an unavoidable radical future, which I think is a really profound insight. We either continue with rising emissions and reap the radical percussions of severe climate change, or we acknowledge that we have, a, we have a choice and pursue radical emissions reductions. No longer is there a non-radical option. Moreover, low-carbon supply technologies cannot deliver the necessary rate of emissions reductions. They need to be complemented with deep, rapid and early reductions in energy consumption. So. Um, if we don't do anything as radical as we talked about last night, four degrees of warming, which is that top scenario. Uh, Anderson is, is one of the scientists who said if we get there, the world's population will be reduced to 10% of its current quantity. So that's a very radical outcome. That's actually a worked out losing on average a million people a week every year for the next 90 years. Most of what happened at the end of the century. But also reducing emissions now has to be done in a very radical way. We have to say there are coal mines and gas plants in Australia, they're simply going to have to be shut down before they finish their productive life. We are going to have to strand capital. The idea that there's happy, happy, win-win answers uh, in reducing emissions is simply part of the political illusion. The other part of the illusion is the other government, um, who I think is really characterised by a desire to win a climate war, what might be called a culture war, and that winning that war is more important than reality-based policy making. I just want to talk about this because I think we really have to think seriously about what this government means in terms of uh, the political challenges which I've been asked to talk about. The first of this is a deeply conservative government that wants to preserve the status quo, including the status quo of the fossil fuel industry. Even though they know that they're trying to hold back the seat, they actually want to hold in place um, a 20th century industrial and mining economy. The second thing is that they are committed to what we, we would call neoliberal or deregulatory economic policy. Privatise everything you can, all that mandatory you get from the Tea Party, it's not about getting government off the people's back, smaller governments, all that sort of thing. The third thing is that they have an, instru an instrumental view of nature. So for them, nature is something to be exploited. It doesn't have intrinsic value. It's simply there to be dug up. And Ian McFarlane, the energy minister on the day after the cabinet was um, uh, sworn in, said it was his aim to get every molecule of coal seam gas, of gas out of, out of the Australian soil that he could. So nature is simply there as an instrument of human industry. The fourth obviously is that they will champion the uh, interest of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the fifth is that they have a deeply anti-scientific, almost pre-enlightenment view of science. So they are obliterating the distance between science and religion. 
Red Hair and Dr. Green and Wife of View, where science is now an ideological battleground. I mean, in, such, in much the same way that um, similar minded people in the United States try to do it with creationism and evolution and politicise what we would conceive as rational science. And this is a, 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 a cultural war, the religious, a religious component. The last characteristic of this government, and I don't think I'm being unfair in these characterisations, I think most people would proudly say to you that this is what we're all about, is they have an ethos of politics as warfare. You've seen that in the United States with the Tea Party, where these people have closed down the government and are proud to do it because they're anti-government. Um, and this is the virtues of confrontation. Um, the Abbott opposition was a one that just oppose, oppose, oppose. Don't try and produce ideas for better Australia. Just oppose, oppose, oppose. Politics is about warfare, uh, confrontation and, and, and extremism and political dumbing down that would for your side. Uh, that's where I think what we face. So Tony Abbott frames uh, climate as delaying action, which is really masking uh, a, de a, a denial that he has. It's put in nationalist terms. We're not going to act unless everybody else does. Um, the national interest first. Um, the politics of resentment, uh, particularly in how it's battler uh, seats against inner city elites like you and me and him. Um, cafe drinking people who, who uh, have a tertiary education, all of you. And Tony Abbott, for, no matter what he says about climate change, this is what he says. The science isn't settled, it's highly contentious, it's not yet proven, it's cooling, it hasn't warmed since 1998, there's no correlation between CO2 and temperature, and he's, quote, hugely unconvinced by the so-called recessive science. So no matter what he says about, oh, I've changed my mind, that's what he thinks. And it's from what he thinks that he'll act, not from what he says that he'll act. So despite what he says, uh, we actually do have a kind of denial as a Prime Minister. So what should our response to this be? Um, I've just written a little piece, um, which of course some of our large climate NGOs have trouble thinking about this. It's on my website, which is called Climate Code Red. Climate Code Red got all the top piece, talks about climate battle lines. The first thing is our climate lobby groups have essentially had a strategy of working in Canberra. So they do media work and they lobby in Canberra and that produces results, or well, some results from the Labor government. Under an Abbott government, that simply will not work because that government is not interested in listening to outside the politics. For them, this is a war. Good ideas are not going to change their, their views. The Abbott government will not be persuaded by reason. I think we know that already. Um, and it's not interested in compromise because climate and environment and environmental deregulation, getting all the coal gas up more quickly, uh, is a battle for them to be won and to, com to compromise is a sign of weakness. Uh, for them, fighting enemies, as I said, is more important than reality-based policy making. So what do we do in response? The first thing I think is we do not cooperate with them. We do not go and help them get bad policies through the Senate some of our groups want to do. Secondly, we make this a very public fight. I mean, I think like the refugee policy, you know, as soon as they got into the government, they suddenly want to take it off. It was useful in opposition to the government. Morris is only going to have weekly briefings. They want to pretend that they solved the problem. With climate, they will do the same thing. They will not want to talk about it. Because this was never about climate change. This was all about Julie Gillard being illegitimate as Prime Minister and the carbon tax being illegitimate. So, they are really incompetent on basic climate science. I mean, when John, Prime, when John Howard was Prime Minister, he was asked uh, on Lake Line what he thought four degrees would mean for Australia. And his answer was, I guess it would be a bit, less, a, bit, a bit more uncomfortable for some. Um, if we you know, get up there and say, what's happening to Murray Darling? What's happening to health? I think we can really, like, keeping climate impacts and the story of people and firefighters and nurses and emergency workers and first responders and what's actually happening, because we're getting records all the time, we can actually embarrass them out of, out of this because they are scientifically incoherent. 
And the second thing is, you know, it goes back to your, your right to work campaign. I think there are really valuable lessons there because, and you know this probably better than I do, that campaign was um, not about lobbying in camp, it was actually about trying to change the government through really great organising in electorates across the union movement systematically in a relatively united way for a length of time. And that is something that the climate movement has not been good at. I think they've had too much emphasis on Canberra rather than doing the, the work on the ground. So our story should be about the, the visceral experiences of people. It shouldn't be about faraway places. It should be about the people in Australia, how they are and will experience climate change. We should be connecting the dots between extreme events and climate change. Climate change is not a future event, it is now. Record temperatures, record heat waves, record floods, record sea surface temperatures, record losses of coral. This is a story about now, not tomorrow. It's a story about family and friends and children and grandchildren and the world that they will live in. I'm, uh, all the, the work on health promotion says the stories about people and family are much more effective than stories about places halfway around the world. I'll talk about that more in, in the workshop this afternoon. So what we need to do is portray a choice between increasing harm, increasing climate harm, and climate safety. Because safety is a really strong mean amongst people. I mean, whether it's workplace safety, whether it's food and fuel safety, whether it's car safety, people understand that safety is really important to them. So if we can demonstrate that climate change is really unsafe, really unharmed, I think we're on good ground. A lot of this is slow and patient work. Um, in Victoria, we were lucky to have two amazing um, campaigns in the federal election, one in the seat of Melbourne, where Adam Van the Green beat off both the major parties, I mean 55% of the vote, and also in the seat of Indi, uh, where Tacky McGowan won. I don't know if you follow the insights, uh, the, the, the Indi story, um, where so, so from your, so from your Bella went, um, and even her Liberal Party colleagues were glad that it happened. That one said, um, I may not be a Buddhist, but I do believe in the law of karma. Um, so, um, wonderful, um, wonderful grassroots campaigns um, using software which comes out of the States, the Obama style software called Nation Builder, of really building up databases, tracking people, fundraising. I think on Insight, called Insight, Insight Australia, there's, there's a very good story about Indi and how they did it. And so I think they're quite inspiring examples of the sort of work that has to be done, which is more difficult, more painful, more expensive than flying to camera and lobbying, but it's the sort of work that we have to do. This work will vary from sector to sector. Um, we'll do different things perhaps on campuses where climates, I mean, the, the Abbott government is now trying to, apparently, has been leaning on the chief scientist to start defunding climate science research and taking away our ARC grant. So there will be a brawl about that, which is an opportunity for people on campuses. For emergency workers, doctors, uh, health workers, and we heard some of that last night, they have a particular me uh, 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 message which is strong. Doctors are probably the most credible voice in Australia on most issues, and particularly on this. Um, Emergency workers talk to the firefighters in Victoria after the 2009 uh, bushfires and they said we were in shock because we were taught how to fight fires and we confronted a fire that we could not fight. So they are very powerful voices. In schools, coastal communities being affected by sea level rises, uh, which is happening here and around the coast, uh, in agricultural communities. So the story um, will change, but it is a story about people and harm and safety. Um, just to finish, um, holding the line is not enough. Protecting what Labor put up as way of policy and plenty of wants to put down is not enough. Climate change is already dangerous. There's more to come. Time is very quickly running out uh, if we to avoid catastrophe. And I think we need to actually, it's easy for me to say, say the sort of things that I've said today, that we really need to do much more than we're doing. We need to put things on the public agenda, which are almost impossible now to put on the, the agenda. Bob Brown tried it a few years ago, and he said there shouldn't be any more coal mines. But he was, in fact, correct. 
uh, about that. We have to be brave in saying what really needs to be done. We need leadership around these sets of ideas. Um, that will mean that fossil fuels will be left in the ground post them. It will mean that, uh, and Mark O talked about that, these industries that consume large amounts of capital that provide few jobs. For, for those of you who weren't here last night, Mark said that the coal, the, the, um, coal and gas industry in Australia employs less people than Bunnings. So this idea that coal and gas and fossil fuel extraction is some cargo coal that's going to save Australia is in fact not true. A large amount of capital comes in. Most of that capital is spent in engineering uh, construction in Asia, not in Australia. 87% of the profits go out and the jobs are less than Bunnings. These are the sort of things that politicians are, are afraid to say in public and we desperately need to. Thanks very much.